side to side. So there's a lot of things, but I'll just let him talk. So Stephen okay. Brobs, the chair. Thank you, Mahendra. Thank you for organizing this session, which uh, has uh, five other speakers. And we're each going to speak only 10 minutes, uh, one virtual, uh, and the other four here, besides myself. Um, because this is uh, billed as a historical kind of retrospective, I want to say a little bit about the history of approval voting. Um, it goes back a long ways when it was not called approval voting, uh, back to at least the 13th century, because popes were elected uh, using approval voting and seem basically to still be so. If you don't know what approval voting is, it's a voting system in which voters can vote for or approve of as many candidates as they like. And the candidate with the most approval wins. Um, so besides uh, the uh, election of popes, uh, it's been used, for example, in the election of uh, secretary generals uh, of the uh, United Nations and in a number of societies. So I'm briefly going to recount um, my history and some of the places that are using approval voting, and then the other speakers will supplement. So I became acquainted with uh, something called negative voting, proposed by somebody named Bohm, B-O-E-H-M, uh, who was referred uh, to who, uh, Oscar Morgenstern, who had retired from Princeton, referred me to. Uh, and he wrote a little paper on negative voting. And the idea was, with negative voting, that you could vote against a candidate or you could vote for a candidate. You couldn't do both. Well, that's really approval voting if there are only three candidates, because voting against a candidate is approving of the other two. But uh, it doesn't generalize for four or more candidates. And about the same time that I was thinking about negative voting, uh, I met Bob Weber, who will speak a little later, uh, at a conference at Cornell uh, in 1976. It was actually a workshop. And uh, he had come up with the idea and the name, approval voting, and uh, written on this. And uh, then uh, I went to another meeting, subsequently at Hilton Head Island, where a number of social choice theorists came together, uh, and met Peter Fishburne there, who was a, and still is, an eminent mathematician who's worked on voting and social choice and many other things. Um, and we agreed to collaborate. So we wrote an article in 1978 called Just Approval Voting, published in the APSR. And then in 1983, we wrote a book called Approval Voting and uh, did a, quite a bit of analysis of different aspects, which I don't have time to talk about now, um, and uh, promoted approval voting, I guess more, I more than Peter. Um, and we got it uh, adopted in a number of professional societies. I at first tried to get it adopted in New Hampshire's uh, presidential primaries in 1980. I'm a native of New Hampshire. I went back. Prodigal son returns, but I wasn't received all that well. Uh, although I did uh, testify before House and Senate committees uh, in the general court, the legislature of New Hampshire. I spoke with the governor. Manchester Union leader ran stories uh, in editorials. Uh, so it got a lot of publicity, but it never got out of committee in either the House or the Senate. So I was unsuccessful there. But then um, <clears throat> other people, particularly mathematicians, became interested. And we eventually got it adopted in the two major um, professional societies of mathematicians, the, American Ma the Mathematical Association of America and the American Mathematical Society. Uh, there are stories behind that, and Jack will probably tell us something about the biggest society to adopt, uh, but then redig on approval voting was the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. So those are some of the societies that adopted it beginning in the 1980s, and it seemed to work well. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> what comes out of the woodwork in a situation like this is those who think they have a better system. <laughs> Uh, so Donald Zari uh, favored uh, the border count and uh, wrote about that. We had an exchange in the late 1980s on the uh, border count versus approval voting. And uh, then other people have proposed other systems, like the hair system of single transfer of the vote. And there's an organization called Fair Vote in Washington that's promoted that for 25 or so years. Jack is associated with that. 
and, uh, and therefore there's competition as to who can reform a system which is basically, in my opinion, broken, <coughs> using basically morality voting. Uh, the person with the most votes wins. Um, so uh, more recently, there has been discussion of uh, what if we want to elect more than one candidate. So there's new work on multi-winner approval voting. Uh, so the aggregation of approval votes is not the same as uh, with single winner approval voting. Mark Kilgore will talk about that. Um, and then a number of people elsewhere has gotten interested, particularly in France. So there have been experiments with approval voting, uh, which ask people how they would vote under approval voting right at the uh, <coughs> polling places. And those have shown that there may be significant differences. And we've also done some retrospective analysis of uh, poll data to show how approval voting might have worked if it had actually been instituted in some important election. We talk about some of that early on in uh, our work. Um, that's a signal I have five more minutes? Wow. Um, there's also been opposition uh, to approval voting by more recently a couple mathematicians, Polinsky and uh, Larrake, French mathematicians, and they've argued that uh, the winner should not be the one who gets the most approval, it should be a kind of median. And it's a little complicated to explain the definition of a median winner, uh, because there may be ties in who uh, <coughs> gets the most votes, but the argument is that the median is uh, <coughs> less vulnerable to manipulation. Uh, and uh, that's probably a good thing, but it's a little complicated to explain. And uh, I definitely do not recommend approval voting in uh, electing more than one winner, because uh, the, let's say, the five-member council that is being elected might be basically uh, <coughs> clones of each other, when presumably in a council and a legislature one wants a diversity of opinions. Uh, so that's why I think it's, it's useful to think about uh, different ways of aggregating approval votes. So it's still basically the same proce simple procedure. You just have to approve or not approve of the candidates. Uh, but by aggregating uh, them in a different way, approvals in a different way, one can get that diversity uh, of opinion in a council, which approval voting generally would not give uh, if it were used straight. Okay, so that's um, very briefly uh, a little background, and um, I must say that <clears throat> uh, the societies that we have tried that have not seen approval voting as a guiding light are uh, mostly social science societies. Uh, political scientists, including the APSA and uh, <clears throat> international relations specialists, uh, including members of the ISA, I'm going to the meetings tonight uh, there, have not seen fit to uh, use approval voting to elect presidents, for example, though the uh, more scientific engineering and math societies have. Uh, so it's not a entirely success story uh, with these kinds of uh, societies. Um, let me conclude by saying that uh, <clears throat> in our book, in 1983, Fishburn and I predicted that uh, approval voting would become the election reform of the 20th century, just as the Australian ballot, the secret ballot, had been the reform of the 19th century. Well, the century ran out on us. And uh, now we're hoping in the 21st century that approval voting uh, not only survives, but thrives, and is more widely adopted and used, because we think it's uh, a natural system. And uh, choosing candidates in multi-candidate uh, situations. And now, I think the recent work on multi-winner systems indicates that it has a bright future there as well. Okay, let me go on, and I think we'll take comments at the end. Uh, so, uh, the next speaker <coughs> is Mark Kilgore, uh, who will talk on the multi-winner aspects, I believe. I should say that uh, I was around in the 1980s. In fact, I knew Steve Krabs around the time that he was starting to work on uh, approval voting 
Uh, and but the only the only actual academic contribution I made at that time was a book review, Rams and Fishman book. Uh, but you know, gradually uh, I got involved and by sometime around 2005 or so or I was working with Steve and with some others on uh, uh, multi winter electrical systems, uh, which have really been quite interesting to me since then. Um, there is uh, one of the reasons for approval voting becoming popular is something called the Handbook on Approval Voting, which was published in 2011. That, 2010. Uh, in that, I, I contributed chapter called uh, approval balloting for multi-winner elections. And, uh, so, since then, I've uh, been kind of a poster boy for uh, approval of multi-winner. Um, I should say that I think I'm probably, I, I may not be very good at that, but I'm certainly better than I am as being technical help for, for the computer. Uh, I will I'll show a couple of my slides. Um, let me say that um, uh, when you have a new idea, uh, it is important for that idea to kind of continue to grow and develop. And I think that um, using multi winner, uh, using approval voting for multi winner elections is, is probably one of the big new ideas for approval voting. Um, as a general context, if you're having an election in which there are, there are only two candidates, we know how that should be done. If you have an election in which there are many candidates but only one winner, well, that's really what all the articles about. That's what approval voting was designed for, and there are many competitive systems uh, for running such elections. Now, multiple winners adds a whole new dimension it's not, it's not obvious uh, exactly what uh, the problems are. It's not exactly, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, there are certainly examples of people who just went ahead and used multi-winner, uh, used approval voting in multi-winner elections without thinking about it very hard. And they ran into, uh, as uh, Steve described, uh, the, the uh, clone problem, the tyranny of the tour. Uh, and uh, some of this is still going on. But, uh, I think um, gradually it will, uh, become, it will come to be seen as, as a problem. And I, I, I hope that it will, because I think that it doesn't help approval voting if it's used in the wrong way, which it is if it's a multi winner election and just counting the rules. Now, um, there are in fact, the situation is somewhat more subtle than you might expect. Uh, in the, and I would kind of illustrate this using uh, one of my illustrations is uh, somebody is running uh, a committee, or somebody is running a committee, is running committees to form a conference. Uh, if, if you're talking about the, uh, uh, the program committee of the conference, then they're perhaps trying to select the best possible papers. And it might, might be a good idea to count just approval votes that way because you would maybe get the very best papers in the field. But for another, for a contrasting example, consider the, the, the local arrangements committee that is trying to decide on venues for the banquet. Uh, there is uh, the, the important thing, since nobody is going to be eating more than one meal, the important thing is to get wheels on the, on the, on the, on the menu that would uh, appeal to as many individuals as possible. So in other words, you want diversity. And uh, the way that I uh, the way that I describe this is that the criteria, the first criterion is individual support. Each each candidate gets into the winning section, be well supported by the voters in comparison to other candidates. But the second criterion is group support. The winning subset, considered as a group, should be broadly supported by the voters in comparison to 
of your substance. And my, my argument is that most of the, uh, most times when approval voting or any, any kind of multi winner election is conducted, there is some kind of balance between these two objectives that's uh, uh, this desired. And I think it's, in fact, to be expected, there'll be lots of different ways to conduct uh, multi winner elections using approval ballots and others. Uh, to achieve these different, these two, the right balance of these objectives. Now, I recently did a study of, <coughs> uh, it was kind of an example of an uh, election in which subset was the sum of the utilities of the candidates in it, all of that's a broad assumption. But then I tried, uh, no, but I, I also assumed the standard strategy for approval voting, that is, people vote for all of the candidates whose utility is above average. And uh, I tried all of the methods that I could come up with for uh, It's a specific example. These are all counting methods for approval ballots. This is to elect a subset of three candidates. As you can see, there are there were only five candidates to begin with, so there are ten possible subsets. And uh, I got uh, uh, eight of those subsets turned out to be the winner or tied for winner on at least one of the procedures. So this was not a, it was not an election that was specifically chosen to be, uh, to be competitive, but it was. So by, by uh, the point for, of this showing you, all of these uh, were methods of counting ballots, approval ballots, and um, there, were, there were lots of ties. But also, there are many, there are many different methods, and they gave many different outcomes. I think I, yeah. okay. So I think we're all okay. I think that's uh, the, the end of the story. Is that there's lots more to do with uh, multi-winner elections. As I say, I think uh, ideas should be developed and put into the areas. This is for approval voting. This is important. Okay. okay thank you, Mark. Uh, our next speaker is virtual. I think we have a video of his talk. Uh, he's one of the uh, early proponents of Google voting and uh, did some very interesting work uh, on his properties. Uh, he's uh, a uh, his PhD is in operations.
Foundation's research, so he's kind of a mathematical social scientist in this regard. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, uh, he was the first to uh, propose the name of Google Voting. Uh, this is Robert Weber. Uh, he uh, is retired from Northwestern University. Uh, he's our next speaker. Aloha. I'm Bob Weber. I'd like to take a few minutes to look back at my early involvement with approval voting. It all started in the fall of 1970 when I was a graduate student at Cornell. Two liberal candidates faced a single conservative in the race to fill Bobby Kennedy's U.S. Senate seat. The liberals ended up splitting over 60 percent of the vote and the conservative won with only minority support. The next day, thinking back over the result, I found myself wishing that I could have voted for both liberals. And then I thought, well, why not? I presented the idea to several colleagues, explaining it as allowing voters to vote for all the candidates of which they approved. The name approval voting stuck. One advantage of approval voting was that it could be immediately implemented. Since the late 1890s, lever machines could be set to allow votes for multiple candidates in a single race, and the then new Votomatic punch card systems were completely compatible with approval voting. To evaluate approval voting, it's necessary to represent voter preferences, predict voter behavior, and compare predicted election results with predictions made for other voting systems. Voter preferences clearly should be represented cardinally via the utilities a voter would derive from the election of any one of the candidates. This allows voters to feel more strongly about the results of some elections than about others, and it helps to clarify why a voter might sometimes cast one approval vote and at other times more than one. Voters will ultimately decide how to vote on the basis of their preferences and how they expect others to vote. I chose to begin with polless elections, a relevant example would be the election of an officer of a professional organization. Later, I'll return to a consideration of polls. But for now, I'll begin by assuming that every candidate is considered by the voters to be equally likely to be in close contention with any of the other candidates. Comparing approval voting with plurality rule, borders rule, or any other weighted voting system, it turns out that a voter will prefer to assign weights to the candidates in order to maximize the weighted sum of differences between individual candidate utilities and the average utility to the voter across all candidates. For approval voting, this translates to an intuitively pleasing rule. Vote for precisely those candidates who seem to you to be better than average. I ultimately chose to imagine societies where the voters have randomly generated preferences and wherein a voter doesn't know which of the many different roles defined by preferences he will be playing when the election takes place. In this case, he'd prefer the use of a system which maximizes expected utility of the elected candidate across all the different roles he might hold. Even in the two candidate case, that socially best candidate might lose the election if a majority of the voters have opposing weak preferences. I evaluated the expected result of the election 
on an efficiency scale. Starting at the bottom with pure random selection of a candidate and peaking at the top with the unobtainable ideal of always electing the candidate of maximal aggregate utility across all voters. How far up in that range the actual expected utility to a voter of the elected candidate under a particular voting system was what I call the efficiency of that system. When there are only two candidates, the efficiency of any voting system is about 81%. This is the price we pay for not being able to measure a voter's overall intensity of preference. Under the plurality rule, efficiency drops as the number of candidates increases. Indeed, it drops asymptotically to 0%. On the other hand, Borda's rule performs well. Its efficiency increases as the number of candidates increases and rises asymptotically to 100%. What of approval voting? It beats Borda's rule slightly in the three candidate case. For four or more candidates, only simulation estimates are available. However, it appears, rather disappointingly, that approval voting's efficiency lies somewhere between that of plurality rule and of borders rule. In both the three and four candidate cases, the best systems I've been able to find are hybrids, combining approval-like and border-like features. In summary, in a polless environment, there seems to be little reason to consider approval voting as a leading alternative to borders rule or various hybrid rules. The conclusion is straightforward. If there is a reason to advocate the use of approval voting over other voting systems, that reason must be found in the way that pre-election polls of the electorate's voting intentions can influence voter behavior. For example, under approval voting, even in the face of polls, voters never have an incentive to assign voting weights to the candidates in an order different from their true preferences. Under plurality voting or borders rule, a non-monotonic assignment of weights is at times a voter's best strategy. Back around 1987, I gave a lunchtime seminar about approval voting at Northwestern. At the end, I illustrated the challenge of dealing with polls by using the 1970 U.S. Senate race in New York as an example. Imagine that approval voting were in use and that polls predicted that most of the liberal voters would double vote for both liberal candidates, leaving the conservative candidate solidly in third place. Then supporters of each of the liberal candidates would have an incentive to not double vote in order to help vault their favored candidate to victory. If enough liberal voters do this, the conservative candidate might actually win, completely invalidating the polls' predictions. As soon as I was done, Roger Meyerson came up and noted that a new poll reporting the change in predicted outcome would likely lead to the liberal candidate supporters switching back to double voting. This would again invalidate the predictions now of the new poll. He expressed his feeling that there should be some type of equilibrium wherein the polls could be correct. Not surprisingly, Roger was right. 
Indeed, the new equilibrium analysis, taking polls into account, revealed several ways in which approval voting is definitively superior to other voting systems such as plurality or borders rule. I'll leave further discussion of this to Roger. In, at least in part. Um, yeah, but first of all, I thank you for organizing this. I, one of the things about uh, uh, plurality voting is that uh, if you have as naturally occurs a, uh, a distribution of preferences where a lot of voters, uh, the bulk of the voters in the electorate have preferences that are in some, we'll call it centrist uh, region, uh, then we can imagine that an important election, like a presidential election, that would have, in the presidential primaries, for example, that, would, that, that would attract a, a lot of candidates, that they, candidates would choose centrist positions, which is where most people are. Um, but uh, having a system that, that uh, forces voters to split the vote, uh, that, that, that creates a cost to having too many uh, candidates uh, who look similar uh, because the, 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 the voters who like them, if they don't, if they don't, if they aren't coordinated, have to split the vote. Uh, that um, that's gonna, the result is going to be that occasionally the the the, the part the, the, the election is going to be won by an extremist who uh, gets all of one wing, uh, one, and the people clustered in the in, in, toward, in, in the center of the of the public opinion uh, just cancel each other out, just split the vote. And, uh, and occasionally you're going to get extremists winning the highest office in the, in the land. That's happened uh, in the last election, and uh, wouldn't have happened if there, I believe, if there had been approval voting. Um, I paper with Bob Weber, the teacher, the other. Um, you know, one of the so so that teaches us that, that we voters understand that we, you can't split the vote. You have to figure out which which centrist you vote for, and that means you have to get coordinated, which means you need leadership, coordinating leadership before the election, and. Um, uh, uh, I think the point of our paper was, um, well, the, of course, democracy is supposed to be about choosing your leaders. So if, if an electoral system, uh, a democratic electoral system doesn't work without coordinating leadership before the election, then there's something wrong. And that was really the point of our paper. Um, we used an assumption that, uh, that after, shortly after the paper was published, the, the technical difficulties with it uh, turned up, and, uh, and I spent a lot of time studying plus on voter things. The problem was to figure out when, uh, what possible races do, do voters take seriously as conditional on my vote making a difference. Um, what's the most likely, uh, what, what are the most likely races that I, I should be worried about, I should be thinking about. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and what Weber and I were trying to argue, and I think a paper that all of whose political points I think are, are valid today, and uh, whose methodology, I'm sorry to say, is, 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 is embarrassingly off, uh, which is why uh, I, think, I, I doubt it's on anybody's reading list now, even though I, I think there are things that have, never, have not been said as well since. Um, electoral systems that require coordinating leadership, like plurality voting, uh, are in the interests of those people who, have, who are in a position to be leaders, the party, uh, the party leaders, uh, media uh, people control the media, and uh, therefore they have a vested interest in it. And again, and, and their interests are adverse to the rest of the to the voting population because the elections have been less competitive. Um, I think uh, you know, uh, uh, Steve. Uh, for, uh, I learned today that Steve Bremps first tried to. Uh, get approval voting adopted in New Hampshire presidential primaries. I think presidential primaries are exactly where it most could, could benefit in the United States, as I say. Unfortunately, New Hampshire might be the worst place because New Hampshire, well, it would be best if you could have gotten adopted because it's so conspicuous, the New Hampshire election. On the other hand, one of the interests, it should be, it, theoretically, it should be an easier sell in Illinois than in, 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 in uh, New Hampshire because the later primaries um, Typically, this, the race has become down to the two, two guys who were the front runners in the previous rounds, and the third ranked guy would say, oh, the approval voting one, that's where my hope is, I'm going to go campaign there, and uh, because they don't, they're, they're not going to be afraid of splitting the vote by, by also adding a vote for me. And his spending more time in that state will then, of course, bring the others into that state, and they'll all make promises to the special interests of that state, and so that state should want to adopt approval voting, and I would argue, and of course, the, 
if, if everybody adopts it, we'll have better presidential primaries. But I'm just saying there's a, a first adopter advantage for any state except New Hampshire. Um, <laughs> but um, let's, I, I think I, I, there was a history where you were arguing with Don Sari, and he was attacking, let me say what I think was the, the essence of the matter. We have, there is no strategy-proof method of social choice. People have to respond to their environment. People will respond to their environment of alternative preferences. And the true test, if we're going to ask a political system, if we're going to advocate a new electoral system to the first political system to adopt it, the first polity to adopt it, you have to road test it theoretically, among other things. And, um, and it is exactly how do voters respond to the competitive environment given voters' desi des desires, and how do candidates, most, even more importantly, respond. Um, Don Sari typically used the fact that he was assuming sincere voting, and with, with rank order systems, uh, there's a unique rank order, you know, with strict preferences, there's a unique vote. Whereas in approval voting, there's an ambiguity. How many of your top people do you vote for? And so he could get all kinds of results where he'd say, if there are any paradoxes that are perverse, I can make them in approval voting. Well, he was manipulating adversely the, uh, the, the, the decisions by the voters of, of who, how many people to vote for. And that is of the essence of that. How would they decide? And how will the, the candidates decide? I, I guess I'd like to say the things that I was trying to do, in, in 1993, I had two papers. Uh, one, effectiveness, you can't read that, effectiveness of electoral systems for reducing government corruption and gains in economic behavior. And the other paper, no, not that paper, where is it? Um, it was also 1993, that was much of 1993, or incentive step number five. Number two and number five are that I want to talk about. The incentives to cultivate favored minorities under alternative electoral systems. This number two, I think I revisited last and I think best in this bipolar multi-candidate elections with corruption, I think. With an electorate that, that, that kind of is split on a, the, the biggest issue to them that splits them is a yes-no issue. I, I use the English term bipolar, and now I'm on all kinds of psychiatry uh, spam <laughs> mail. Uh, but, uh, but other than that, I think that's the, that's the paper that replaces the GEP 93. Um, what do I want to say in brief? Um, I think the incentives to cultivate favored minority starts with the, the Cox threshold, of, the Cox threshold of diversity. If you're looking at uh, the, the, the bipolar case, where there's, there's people are split on a yes and no, and you, you ask for candidate, you've got given K candidates. Um, I asked the I think Cox asked the question, and I refined it in this paper. Um, what's the largest sot Q fraction of a, we'll call it a minority, such that there exists an equilibrium where all the K candidates choose to um, um, choose to go with, with, the, with, with, the, with the one minus Q, called majority block. Um, and uh, under the assumption that once they choose to be on the on the left side, let's say Q is the leftist minority, and one minus Q is the right. What's the largest Q on the left, such that everybody will go on the right? Well, the assumption is that in their actually voting, the voters will treat all the left leftist candidates, all the rightist candidates symmetrically. And the answer with plurality voting is the droop quota. Once you have one one over K plus one K, candidate, once Q is larger than one over K plus one, people, a serious win motivated candidate wants to go over there. And then if he's win motivated, it means he has a chance of winning which means that uh, you, you're in a single winner election, it's going to be you've got a problem. Um, with negative voting, with pure negative voting, you've got a possibility of, of a majority, of a strict majority being neglected. Uh, you, you, you can't even get it. So there can be too much clustering or too little clustering, and approval voting is neutral with respect to that. Um, the, uh, the, the corruption side was saying, supposing you've got people on two camps, but they differ in the corruption level, and the voters all care. They like some like the leftists, some like the, the rightists better, and uh, but everybody hates corruption, and and corruption is known. It's like when a candidate files his, his candidacy papers, he says, "I'm a leftist or rightist." He does that. Is he, is he committed to the leftist position or the rightist position? And here's how much I'll steal from the national treasury for my personal, you know, uh, like a bidding on my salary. And everybody would like zero, the minimal corruption. The question is. Can you guarantee that in an equilibrium, 
a guy who has zero corruption, was the minimal corruption on the majoritarian side, will win the election? And the answer is a yes under approval voting and no under almost any other, any other scoring rule. Um, this kind of system, the um, single transferable vote also works pretty well. So uh, the, it, what, what, what we're trying to do is disentangle the left versus right and the incentive for candidates to reduce the corruption. Um, the, uh, the, where the, where the uh, single transferable vote fails uh, is on what I went further with in the consent of cultivating minorities was I considered where the, the campaign strategy that each candidate has to do is he decides on a district, he's got, he's got an average of $1 per voter if he wins the election. And what he can do is he can set a distribution, offer some voters a lot of, a, more than a dollar and some voters less, nobody less than zero, let's say taxes are fixed. So he's got to give away money. And now the only question is does he try to appeal to everybody equally? give more to some, less to others? The answer is you do want to give more to some and less to others under any electoral system. But how unequal? Do you want to cultivate a favored minority? So this is the incentive of candidates to, to divide us in different ways. And the idea would be basically choose the distribution. Every, in the model, every candidate, every voter then goes to, to, to each of the candidates' little, uh, uh, a, a elect, he logs onto the, 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 the candidate's electoral site, puts, types in, the voter types in his voter ID number, gets a randomly generated promise out of the distribution, and then, he, then of course he votes for the candidate who promised him the most money. Or in the electoral system, he gives more, more votes and more to vote. He ranked them under approval voting. It's complicated. What does he do? The answer was, under single transferable vote, which worked well against corruption, it still created the, the, the results that were multiple equilibria, including equilibria where the, where the most important race was avoiding being the first guy cut out in the single transferable vote with a single winner where they're going to cut out the person who has the least first uh, preferences and uh, transfer their votes to the, to the next. Um, and uh, so there could be, there were equilibria with great inequality and equilibria with less inequality, whereas approval voting encouraged candidates, it was complicated, but encouraged candidates to give the overwhelming majority of voters a little more than one and finance that by, by omitting a small minority. So, that, so the incentives to create favored minorities was much lower in this model under approved voting than anything else. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is Jack Nagel uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, right uh, my remarks are, are about uh, approval voting strengths and weaknesses, principally in comparison with the hair single transferable vote system, which I prefer to call instant runoff or IRB. Uh, I subtitled my remarks, uh, Reflections of a Friendly Apostate, uh, and the reasons for that will become clear because a lot of talk will be about my experience of approval voting and emphasizing the experience of actual uses of approval voting because I think we learn tremendously more from experience. Uh, theory can go a long way, but the assumptions are our theories may or may not correspond with the behavior of voters. And what's all this sign language about? Oh, Steve, you're in the way of the camera. Oh, no, no, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Oh. Well, now you're not fine. Okay, okay, okay. The other way, It was fine before. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, we learn a great deal from experience. Uh, actual voters can think of all sorts of ways to behave that we might not even anticipate in the best of our theories. Uh, I first learned about approval voting from Steve uh, in the probably late 1970s, and I quickly became an enthusiastic convert. I started advocating it everywhere I could, from Atlantic City to New Zealand. Uh, I had no takers in those two places, but I was instrumental in three actual uses of approval voting. Two of them fulfilled expectations. Uh, these were first a straw vote in December 1983 among eight candidates for the Democratic presidential nomination. This was taken with uh, by members of the Democratic State Central Committee in Pennsylvania. Uh, the other, Steve has mentioned, the first use of approval voting for the presidency of the IEEE, which at that time had about 350,000 members. Uh, tens of thousands of them actually voted, 60,000 in 1970. Uh, in those two multi-candidate contests, uh, many voters approved two or more candidates. As a result, also RANs received substantial votes rather than suffering from wasted vote fall off. 
Uh, but the winners emerged with support from a substantial majority of voters. So approval voting accomplished all that we hoped of then. Uh, both of those uh, experiences were written up in papers. Steve and I co-authored one about the IEEE. The third experience did not turn out so well. Ironically, this was my own department, the political science department at Penn. Uh, in the early 1980s, I had chaired a committee to revise uh, our departmental bylaws, and I got approval voting written in to uh, elect the chair with the help of a colleague, Henry Tooney, and uh, Bill Crystal, who's uh, since gone on to fame and fortune elsewhere. Uh, a few years later, we had a serious multi-candidate contest. The dean had authorized a, an external search for a new chair. We had five strong candidates. Any one of them would have been a great uh, help to our department. There was no guarantee that whoever won would accept the dean's offer. So our vote was advisory to the dean. It seemed clearly in our interest to approve as many as possible. And the rule says that all those who got approved on a majority of ballots uh, could be appointed by the dean. The situation seemed ideal for casting multiple approval ballots. I did. I think I voted for four of them. Uh, the vote was by secret ballot. When we counted the results, we got a rude shock. A substantial faction, a minority of the department, had bullet voted for only one candidate same candidate, and as a result, that candidate was the only one who emerged with the majority of approvals. Uh, you can imagine that the Cabal's collusion uh, did a lot of damage to collegial trust and goodwill, but besides being uh, furious, I was also puzzled what had happened, why approval voting failed in this situation, but not in others. So I enlisted uh, mathematician Sam Merrill to help me with this, and we came up with an explanation that was published in the APSR in 1987. Uh, and uh, what Sam and I argued is that uh, approval voting strategically does not, is more problematic if you use it in a two-stage procedure, which ours was because we're basically nominating to the dean, uh, or if you used it with ballot threshold requirements, such as the majority requirement. So we decided that, that approval voting could still be recommended if you just uh, had approval plurality for a single winner in a single-stage procedure, and we breathed a sigh of relief. Nevertheless, that experience left me with three warning flags in the back of my mind. First, that insincere bullet voting can be a real problem with the approval ballot. Secondly, strategic voting is more likely as a product of concerted behavior among groups as opposed to the atomized decisions of isolated individuals. And third, the threat or actuality of strategic voting can have a powerful emotion, emotional impact that threatens group solidarity. It's not just a matter for bloodless, rational calculations about outcomes. Uh, now, those concerns came to the forefront in my mind some time later when it occurred to me, or I would argue, that the original U.S. presidential election system was strongly analogous to a group of voting system used in the first four U.S. presidential elections. And I wrote that up in a journal in politics paper in 2007 about what I call the Bird dilemma. Um, now, uh, getting to the comparison with instant runoff voting, uh, I had done work in New Zealand uh, on the adoption there of mixed member proportional, and as a result of that, I uh, came to the attention of the group that's now called Fair Vote and its leader, Rob Ritchie, and established a friendly relation, formal and informal, that's continued uh, for 25 years. Fair Vote was interested in New Zealand mainly as an example of how reform could be accomplished in a, a single vote plurality system. Their preferred solution is the hair single turn sorable vote system with multiple winners, but that's a proportional representation system. For single winner elections, they had the analogous or the minimal case of hair of uh, the instant runoff vote. With a lot of persistence and savvy, fair vote and its allies have conceived, uh, achieved considerable success with the instant runoff voting been adopted in a number of cities in California and Minnesota, and most recently uh, for all uh, elections in the state of Maine, although that was subject to a court challenge and throws its implementation into doubt. So uh, as practical reforms, approval, morality, and IRB are competitors. As a friend of both Steve and Rob, I was kind of caught in the middle. Uh, in several situations where the adoption or repeal of IRB was under attack or from advocates of approval voting, 
I intervened to defend IRB, and then in a Minnesota court case, see, and I submitted affidavits on opposite sides. My side prevailed. <laughs> now, uh, what I'd like to do, although I think my time is running short, is to make a quick comparison of advantages and disadvantages of the two systems. The advantages of approval voting, first of all, is the simplicity of implementation, the binary vote, uh, simple counting, uh, conducive to existing equipment, uh, and the counting does not to be, need to be centralized as IRB does. Secondly, as Steve and others have pointed out, uh, approval plurality is monotonic and IRB can be non-monotonic, uh, like any multi-stage procedure. Uh, thirdly, with respect to strategic voting, approval should never produce favor of betrayal, which is a big problem with uh, single vote plurality. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the disadvantages of the rural plurality, it conveys less information about the voters' preferences unless people genuinely are indifferent among sets of candidates. Uh, but the big problem is that there's great uncertainty about how many approvals the voter will or should cast. Uh, look at that quickly, uh, schematically, in one minute. It can be influenced by valid instructions, as a student of mine demonstrated empirically. Secondly, uh, the average utility rule, which is appropriate when voters have no information, is subject to framing effects, so it's not independent of irrelevant alternatives. You add a candidate at the bottom and you'll prove a different number. Thirdly, the with information, the polling assumption that Steve has advocated, uh, where you vote for the preferred front runner plus any trailing candidate you like better than the preferred front runner, makes sense and would solve the problem where you have a very asymmetric division of the majority, the nader Gore problem or the Stein-Clinton situation. If voters are instrumentally rational, rational, they should be hit according to the poll assumption. But if you have a, a, a non duverger in equilibrium where you have three or more candidates who are pretty equally divided, then the problem of the Burr dilemma comes up. The two who divide the majority group, each that group should all cast double ballots to votes but each candidate has an incentive to have some of his or her supporters cut a few uh, so that that candidate will merge as the, the approval plurality winner. And this is a situation that I argue happened between Burr and Jefferson in 1800 and led to a debacle. Now the reason for this problem is that approval of plurality violates the later no harm principle by casting a sincere second vote for your true second favorite candidate, you can damage your first favorite. And uh, that is problematic. IRB is not subject to later no harm, although it does have some of the disadvantages I pointed out uh, previously. So between uh, imperfect systems, as we always have such a choice, there's an argument to be made for both of these systems. What I'd really like to see is more experience with each. We are accumulating quite a lot of experience with IRB, not to mention the century of experience that's existed in Australia. Uh, I'm glad that Aaron Hamlin and his colleagues at the Center for Election Studies are getting support for possible more experiments with approval. I'd like to see what actually happens in real competitive situations. Uh, sometimes it seems to work, uh, but there's great risk that it may not in some cases as well. Thank you, Jack. Uh, our final speaker is Mahendra Prasad, and uh, he was the organizer of this session. Uh, is getting the slides ready, uh, I want to frame my discussion. So basically, I'm going to be talking, so mechanism is about trying to achieve an objective function given that people will be insincere, can be insincere. So given that's the case, the question is what should our objective function be? So that's a lot of what my talk's about. And basically what I'm going to be arguing is that we should think of uh, approval voting as representing maximization of consent or consent of the majority as opposed to thinking of it in terms of, instead of thinking of majority rule in terms of uh, you know, majority preference, which is the uh, usual interpretation of such a choice.
So this just gives you an idea of where, where we're going. We're first starting off with a thesis and a background, and four arguments and supplementary slides, you know, if y'all want to talk about more stuff. So uh, 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 first, uh, there's two interpretations of the majority rule in the literature. One is majority preference, the other is consent of the majority. So in the majority preference uh, interpretation, uh, the voters ask, which do I prefer, the proposal or the status quo? And this generalized multiple alternatives is represented by counter state methods. Uh, this, the, the, the same interpretation is consent of the majority. And the voter asks in this situation, given that they're confronted with a proposal, yes or no, do I consent to the proposal? And when generalized multiple alternatives, this is represented by approval voting. So this is a hole in the democratic theory literature. Because while democratic theorists uh, would often use both interpretations, they rarely distinguish between the two interpretations. Uh, so if you look at the literature, and I have it in other slides that I'm not going to go over, but they're in the supplementary slides, there are several democratic theorists who use the language of consent of the majority. These are people like John Mott, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, John Rawls, and Nicholas de Condorcet. Uh, so my goal here is to demonstrate that to generalize majority rule to multiple alternatives, uh, consent of the majority and approval voting are better generalizations than majority preference and counter state methods. So, despite there being strands of majority consent in the literature, uh, you know, existing in a lot of canonical works, uh, it's traditionally interpreted as majority rule, as majority preference in the social choice literature. Uh, and this allows a paradox, uh, primarily counter state's paradox, which is that you know a voting system either violates transitivity or independent relevant alternatives if it tries to adhere to majority preference. That's roughly speaking what it is. Uh, and this creates a big problem in terms of normatively generalizing uh, uh, majority rule to multiple alternatives, which is the big case that Riker made, William H. Riker made, that basically because you're going to always have cycles or possibility of cycles, you can't ex you know majority rule and voting is meaningless, and so ultimately democracy has can't be based on. Some popular consent or will of the people or general will has to be based on some sort of liberal conception. Now I'm not denying the liberal conception, but I'm saying that like, you know, well it can have meaning, votes can have meaning. So there are the various defenders of majority rule. These are uh, on two alternatives. These are like Robert Dalton gives four major arguments. Christian Liss more recently uh, gives uh, three major arguments for majority rule on two alternatives. Uh, but both agree that all the arguments have difficulty generalizing to multiple alternatives. So these are roughly the four arguments. May's theorem, which is given by both Dahl and Liss, Ray Taylor theorem, both given by Dahl and Liss, maximization of self-determination, which is given by Dahl alone, and then consciously a jury theorem, given by both of them. So what I want to show is that an Arobian version of approval voting generalizes each of the four arguments better than any other Arobian voting system. Now one reason I have to define it in terms of Arobian terms is so I can make the claim that it's better than any other Arobian voting system. So uh, what is an Arobian voting system? Basically, each voter submits a rank ordering of alternatives, and the output is a rank ordering of alternatives. Uh, so we need to also define a majority aggregation procedure uh, to define uh, the Arobian version. So uh, basically, it's, you know, here's a more technical version. Basically, if more voters prefer x over y, then prefer y over x, and then x should be socially ranked above y, vice versa. And then, of course, if uh, an equal number prefer x over y, is prefer y over x, then, and then, uh, then x and y should be socially ranked equal. Okay, so basically, Arobian approval voting is, you know, each voter, they, they partition the set of alternatives into two parts, right? They are different between any two alternatives they consent to, they're uh, indifferent between any two alternatives they don't consent to, but they prefer any alternative they consent to over any alternative they don't consent to. So this turns, you know, approvals into a, uh, an Arobian preference order that has at most two levels of preferences. And then just application of uh, majority aggregation procedure to that set of uh, Arobian preference orders uh, is basically you know, Arobian approval voting. Uh, so what I show is that uh, Arobian approval voting generalizes these four arguments better than any uh, other Arobian uh, voting system. So first let's start with uh, May's theorem. So May and uh, May famously, Kenneth May famously argued that uh, uh, majority rule on two alternatives with unrestricted domain could be uh, could be uniquely uh, characterized by four conditions, decisiveness, anonymity, neutrality, and positive responses. What I do in the generalization is so to show that among the, <coughs> uh, back up, back up. <laughs> the Arobian uh, uh, approval voting system is the unique Arobian voting system with the least restrictive domain, 
which satisfies May's four conditions and independent relevant alternates, or IA. So this is really interesting in its relationship to Aerosteam, right? So uh, let me come up here. So basically, if you look at the conditions of Aerosteam, which are here on the right, and the conditions of our theorem on the left, except for decisiveness in unrestricted domain, basically our conditions imp uh, imply Aero's conditions. So you take the strongest versions of Aero's condition, like for example, anonymity implies non dictatorship Neutrality, assuming that you know the voting system doesn't always output a tie, implies non-imposition. So, so um, you can go to the next slide. So what we can do is we can restate the result in an Aramaic way, which combines us. Basically, what we've done is we said we can ask the question: What is the aerobic voting system with the least restricted domain, which satisfies decisiveness and the strengthened versions of the remaining Aero's theorem's conditions? And basically, the answer to that is aerobic approval voting. So then there's the Ray Taylor theorem, right? And basically what it says is, under certain background conditions, majority rule maximizes the overall utility of voters when there are two alternatives. Uh, and what we show is, okay, this is just a special case of a multiple alternatives generalization of, uh, of the Ray-Taylor theorem, uh, and that's basically characterized by Arovian approval voting. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So um, now you can, you can potentially criticize the Ray-Taylor theorem, saying, well, it uses non-traditional utility theory, because under traditional utility theory, you know, if at least one voted for X over Y, and at least one voted for Y over X, then, uh, you know, uh, it, you can't really say which, you know, alternative maximizes the overall utility of all voters, right? So, uh, and, and another prism is that it doesn't use a, a notion of utility that is, you know, has basis in economics or psychology literature. So we can use another notion of, of utility, not, uh, it's not traditional, but it's, it's a Herbert Simon's satisfies account. Right? Which is basically the idea that each voter has a utility threshold, and if, uh, if a, an alternative is above that threshold, then they consent to it if they are satisfied by it. And if it's below that threshold, they don't consent to it and they, you're not satisfied by it. And then it should be pretty clear that when voters are sincere, a Roman approval voting chooses the alternative which maximizes the number of voters that are satisfied. Uh, and I think that's a better uh, utility argument than the Ray Taylor theory. But we can still generalize it with the Ray Taylor theory. Then we move on to the next argument, which is the idea that. Uh, Approval voting uh, maximizes uh, uh, self-determination. So the way to think of it in this case is think of each alternative as a potential contract, right? It's a potential multilateral contract. And each voter, it, when they're sincere, they consent to exactly those alternatives to which they consent to, and they don't consent to those which they don't consent to, then clearly, you know, approval voting would, would choose the alternative that maximizes the number of voters who get an alternative to which they consent to, that the contract to which they so it maximizes the consent in that sense, right? And then the final argument is kind of says jury theory. So under appropriate background conditions, majority rule and two alternatives tracks truth. Now, what our generalization does is that we show that aerobic approval voting is the unique aerobic voting system with the least restrictive domain for which there exists background conditions such that it satisfies kind of jury theory, it's decisive, it's neutral, and it uses majority aggregation on every pair of alternatives. So, you know, counter state methods can't do that because they, to maintain transitivity, they have to violate the defense realm and alternatives. So they can't maintain uh, majority of preference on all the pairs. But, uh, 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 but uh, uh, a roving approved voting can do that. It can ensure that you always use majority aggregation on every pair of alternatives. So what we've demonstrated is that a roving approved voting generalizes the four arguments for majority rules to multiple alternatives. It suggests that majority consent is a better interpretation of majority rule than majority preference. And additionally, it suggests that approval voting is a better generalization of majority rule than its kind of same methods. So with all that said, I think what I think I'm trying to demonstrate here is that we should think of approval voting as a better norm for multiple alternatives than uh, the kind of same methods in terms of representing majority rule. The question should be, we've developed several methods for uh, trying to track kind of same, uh, kind of same winners. And I think there should be more mechanism design and research on and empirical research to understand how to achieve sincere approval winners. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we got those six speakers. Which, uh, I think it's a bit of an accomplishment. Um, and now it's time for discussion. First of all, I want to ask if any of the uh, speakers have anything to add uh, in light of the other speakers. Yes, Jack. Um, an addendum to, to Mark Mark's 
many, some of you may have heard before, but one of the really unfortunate things that happened over the last couple of decades is that we had two, of course there were more, but two in the, in the arena reforms trying to solve the same problems with a single vote for Brownlee, and uh, sometimes the supporters of one became enemies of the other because they wanted their own system to prevail. Uh, most likely what happens and then is we revert, revert to the status quo and we get no reform at all and no experience with the new systems. So I really have argued strongly and would continue to argue that each we need more experience with both the alternative vote IRB and with approval voting, but they shouldn't try to tear each other down. They shouldn't try to block the adoption where one group has a foothold on the ground, let them do it and see what happens. Uh, and uh, not try to get the repeal or, or to revert uh, to, to the status quo so that someday, far in the future, your, your favorite might prevail. Now, in some situations, and this was sort of what happened with the I treat Triple E, a group may say, we want to know what would be the best reform here, and you can lay up pros and cons of each and, and let them choose it up. Uh, but that's different than kind of coming in to try to tear down uh, uh, competing reforms. Any other speakers want to say anything? So, yes. I'd like to extend your, I think, both for, if a speaker, an advocate for either reform, if given, if given an audience, should try to mention the other reform as well, as a general rule. They're both, they're both worthy of consideration for sure. Um, can, I just wanted, um, on Mark, I, I don't know, if, I, I wasn't clear what proportional, uh, what multi winner ABs you were considering. Uh, he, when I thought about this, the, the, it seemed to me one that was, it, I don't know if it, this was on your list, that, which is the, the, the generalization of DeHaan's PR to, uh, to approval voting, which would be, um, is that on your list, the DeHaan's yes, PR? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. It's, it's not under that name. Okay, yeah, what, what do you call it? This is where um, the first, the first you're, you're going you're to allocate K seats. Uh, I'm sorry, you're going to allocate M seats. M is the number of seats. If you're going to allocate M the district magnitude seats, the first seat goes to the guy who has the most approval votes. Then to allocate the second seat, you discount the, uh, you divide the, the, the uh, any, any vote which included the winner of the first only counts as half a vote. And the general rule is if, if, if when we're allocating um, a seat partway through the list, any vote that has already proved of S winners so far Counts you divide by one over s plus one is the is the, uh, is, the is, is the value of that approval vote in, in electing the next guy, and this would generalize the Hunt rule for uh, uh, if everybody single, single voted. Okay, but this or, is uh, if, any, if everybody voted for a part a single party list, for the, if everybody voted for Democrats and Republicans, if either vote a straight Republican list or straight Democrat list, then this would allocate according to the Democrat and Republican. Okay, that, that's called sequential proportional SPA in my list. Sequential proportional, thank you, right. And another, uh, be, because it's it's a uh, uh, it's a sequential version of proportional approval where yeah. uh, you go through an entire full set by subset by subset. Another, um, another one which is on the list, we, we think that uh, sequential proportional is a lot like uh, Jefferson. Oh. Jefferson is to hunt. Yeah, okay, so the, the, the other one is um, uh, Webster. With Webster, instead of fractions, one, one half, one third, one quarter, you use one, one third, one fifth. So that's another one that's obviously I see, the, the Webster both, numbers. Both sequentially and spontaneous. Yeah. 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 I should mention that uh, there are some attempts to combine. Uh, what are the foundations of each system, uh, the foundation of uh, ranking systems and the foundation of approval systems. And um, I've written a paper with uh, uh, Ramsey, uh, what's his last name? Sanford. Sanford. Yeah. Um, called Preference Approval Voting. So you ask the voters to do think two things. You ask them to indicate a preference order, as you do with any of the ranking systems. Um, but you also ask them to draw the line between those acceptable and those not acceptable. 
and we have rules uh, to uh, determine uh, which uh, takes priority under what circumstance. It, it seems to, because each system is, uh, each, each way of um, giving information, ranking versus approval, is giving different kinds of information, uh, it's a good question, I think, to ask, how might this be combined if you want to ask voters uh, to inform on both criteria, preference, and where they draw the line. Anything else that the speakers want to add? Uh, just a, a comment about Mahendra's uh, ideas. Uh, they have some appeal to me because I think there really are situations where what we're looking for is something like consent. Uh, I've, in retirement, done a lot of work with the League of Women Voters, which is the most effective reform organization in the U.S., and uh, they have a big Quaker tradition, uh, so they make decisions by consensus, but consensus does not mean unanimity in the Quaker style. Consensus is, you would only say this is unacceptable to me if it really is below a threshold uh, negative voting ballot. Uh, otherwise, you would go along if, if it seemed like most of one. And, and that's not a bad system, but the cultural norms that support that being done properly, as opposed to somebody, you know, throwing the weight around with a kind of lever of veto, my way or the highway, um, are, are delicate and uh, they don't exist everywhere. So the question is how we can find them or how we can foster them. Also in that connection, uh, I mentioned the experiment by Ed Koch back in the 80s, it was published in Polity. The ballot instruction could make a difference on that. So he did an experiment where one was the most neutral approval ballot instruction, vote for one or more. And that got fewer, elicited fewer approval, multiple votes, than the next, which was vote for all those you approve of. And then the third was vote for all that are acceptable to you. And that got still more multiple approvals. Uh, and so you could frame instructions to make this empirical, not theoretical. Uh, that might list something like that, but then you still need people who are responsive or have the kind of cultural norms to do this in a genuine and sincere way rather than a way to maximize their own uh, veto power. So, uh, I'd like to respond to what Jack said. So, I think, um, well, in terms of uh, the manipulation, honestly, you know, basically all voting systems are suspect to manipulation, so we have always have to take into account mechanism design, basically, uh, whenever we're dealing with voting systems. Uh, and take into account the empirical situation that's going on when, you know, in the particular voting uh, situation. Um, I think you can, we can figure out a lot of what we need in terms of background institu institutions from conversing. This conversation, actually, I think that's what most of this political writing was about, was what kinds of background institutions you need when, you, uh, when you're having a majority vote. Because it wasn't, it wasn't just a favor of majority, you wanted background institutions that encouraged, you know, people being educated, people being uh, independent thinking, people <coughs> being honest, people being, um, uh, people being, you know, altruistic, and so, uh, and then this would lead to the, these are the background conditions of the jury theorem. That's what makes the jury theorem work. And so, what I think we have to do today is focus a lot on, okay, well, what kind of background institutions do we need to to get, you know, people to behave more? Like, now, obviously, you know, we can't guarantee it, but it's better to have, you know, certain background institutions to, to push towards the norms, so then, you know, basically, these voting systems can work better. But that's true. It's, it's true of every voting system. Uh, I think that brings in deliberative democracy. Yeah. the literature out there that says people benefit from deliberation, and uh, this presumably sets the tone for voting in the end. Yeah. Well, I, I might say that that kind of application is not the typical election application. In an election, we have a highly competitive situation, especially when only one can win. And so those assumptions are going to fall out but when you want to approve a set that has that broad acceptability, uh, there are situations where we want to do that, maybe more for policies or for nominating a slate of people. Uh, and if we can find ways to achieve that, it would be a good thing. Using an approval ballot, perhaps. I think we should open things up. We have a few uh, non-speakers uh, in the audience, so <laughs> thanks for coming. If you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to make them. Yes. Um, I'm not uh, real familiar with this literature, so I apologize for my ignorance on it. But 
on the, uh, the subject of manipulation of voting systems, uh, plurality voting versus approval voting, what would be the impact on the candidates themselves as far as getting the system? In other words, are candidates more likely to lie under plurality voting or approval voting? Is there any research on that subject? Uh, I'm not sure about the lying. Well, to appeal to voters, yeah. not revealing their true policy preferences. Uh, a big yeah. argument for both approval voting and uh, for the ranked choice instant runoff voting is that it should either proponents and say that they will produce less adversarial campaigning because you would want supporters of some, some of your rivals to cast an approval vote for you as well as for the rival, or, or cast a second preference for you, as well as the first preference for the rival. And there is uh, empirical evidence from some American cities using the IRB system that campaigns have been uh, somewhat less adversarial. Uh, they're still competitive, so it's not going to be, you know, all kumbaya, but uh, it, it, it might go in that good direction. Now, a big problem with approval that, that I coined the bird dilemma term is that strategic tension. It's much easier to say, okay, cast your vote, first vote for me, and I have no problems with your casting a second preference for somebody else. But when that second vote under approval counts equally with the first vote for me, then you really don't want them, or at least not all of them, uh, to cast that second approval or rival, because that might sink your own situation, your own prospects. What are the criticisms of approval? voting is that there's no uh, standard to determine uh, for voters where they draw the line between acceptable and uh, non-acceptable. And I'm not particularly bothered by that. I think uh, voters uh, should make up their own minds, and some are going to be more discriminating than others. So the discriminating voters might pull a vote and vote for only one, and less discriminating are going to say more are acceptable. And I think we can have different standards. Uh, so this is apart from the strategic element of just giving voters uh, sovereignty, and I think that's a good thing. Is it up? Yes, over here. This is a question with respect to the multi-runner for approval voting. Um, say we introduce party competition into that context. What sort of what so what you know what would a seat maximizing party tell its voters to do? Apart, especially in Brazil, where, you're, where a candidate was allowed to, 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 to 
on his own. The Central Committee didn't say, it didn't have a say if an incumbent could run for re-election on the, on the label of the party that elected him. Then once you get the Druf quota, you're guaranteed a seat no matter what your party is doing. And everybody's running for the Druf quota, and it essentially became equivalent to single non-transferable vote with all the tearing apart and the, the, the anyway, it, it's, um, whereas approval voting within the party list, where when you vote for a party, you can then approve as many people as you want uh, on that party ballot, and then the, the K seats that are being allocated are, are being allocated to the top, uh, the, if, this, if, the, if the party gets K seats, they go to the people who are approved by the most people. Now you've got candidates competing not to car carve out their own constituencies, but to, 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 to appeal to the mainstream, the center of the party. Uh, that doesn't provide diversity, so to use the cross party to solve the diversity problem, and then within the party list, you want comp competition based on competence, honesty, uh, effectiveness for, for, for voter uh, constituency work. Uh, that, that, that would be, be would, would, approval voting would be, would be, should have a very strong case for that in that context. Thank you, I'm sorry we didn't, didn't try to talk about that. Approval voting as the use within the party list for open list PR. Yeah, I'm not sure of any place where it's used. Typically, the, typically their countries have one or three approvals, and I would say allowing the voters to approve them is, if you're going to have a limited number, list, increase the number and let them approve up to any, you know. If, if I mean, there was model legislation for something very much like that in 1993, that was the original vision for proportional representation in this country. And in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about why that politically not workable. It was called the free list system, if you want to look it up. Okay, yeah, right. uh, it's very connecting. You, you mentioned before different types of variables that would affect the number of approvals that a voter would put on the ballot. Um, I mean, some of them are kind of out of control, like a uh, number of candidates maybe even predicted the number of approvals on average. Um, but would you go and talk a bit more in terms of uh, variables that are within, more within control, such as ballot instructions, um, and the, uh, you, you mentioned differences between different types of uh, levels within the variables, such as like different types of language. So how much of those differ? And for uh, the different ends of the spectrum, like, do you see that as being good or bad in terms of leading towards a, what we might consider a good outcome? Uh, well, in general, although Steve's right that a discerning voter or a voter who has a very, you know, seat one candidate is way better than the others, and that you should be able to vote for just one, uh, in general, if a lot of people do that, approval voting is breaking down and it's going back to a single vote plurality. So you want, for the system to work, you have to have a lot of people who will cast multiple in the Katcha experiment, I think the numbers were, with the minimal instruction, 1.7 approvals per ballot on average, and with the most uh, I think he varied that, so this is one figure. But uh, it went up to two uh, approved and 2.1. So it's not huge, but it has an effect, and uh, it might have more effect if it were not just uh, something written on a paper, but something emphasized in, in social uh, I do think uh, with more knowledge, we, you know, polls or the like, we will get fewer approvals uh, because the front runner kind of thing starts to take over, uh, as opposed to voting under complete ignorance when we would probably vote for all those with above average utility, which should typically be less than fewer than half the candidates, but more than one in most cases. Uh, the, big, the big thing that I worry about is the strategic thing, and, and, and again, the argument that I would make is that we shouldn't think of voters as individuals, I mean, sometimes they behave as individuals, but they typically, in competitive situations, behave under the influence of leaders, candidates, parties, interest groups, opinion leaders, and those leaders, with them, it's much more of a game theoretic than a decision theoretic situation. Rogers, fairly well. And uh, the, the risks that leaders, whether overtly or covertly will encourage people to bullet vote uh, is a real one. I 
think we're at the end of our session. I thank everybody for coming, and especially the speakers.